Excellencies, distinguished ambassadors, civil society, members of the media, friends and colleagues, greetings to you all. It is my privilege to welcome you to the New York virtual observance of World Press Freedom Day 2022, co-organized by the United Nations Department of Global Communications and the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO. My name is Melissa Fleming, and I am the United Nations Under Secretary General for Global Communications. I am delighted to join you as we observe this year's World Press Freedom Day, the focus of which is on journalism under digital siege. In parallel to our observance here in New York, this important day is celebrated at a global conference in the Republic of Uruguay, which is taking place from the 2nd through the 5th of May. Today's New York event will begin with a series of messages by distinguished speakers. This will be followed by a compelling interactive discussion on the topic of media viability in our digital world, with the participation of journalists, the UN, academia, and civil society. We hope that this observance will spark dialogue, inspire action, and lead to solutions to the many challenges facing journalists today. Every year, World Press Freedom Day serves as an occasion to remind us of the media's value. It helps us to highlight the current challenges to press freedom and honor those whose lives have been lost in the pursuit of truth. Creating a safe environment for journalists and media workers to thrive in their profession must be a priority. Journalists must work in conditions safe for them to investigate and report without fear of threat or consequence. The voices of women journalists must be specifically protected since they are targeted much more than their male colleagues, particularly in the online realm. Information has been and continues to be the currency of democracy. But new technologies and innovations are altering the media landscape, presenting both opportunities and a new set of challenges for journalists. In the face of digitally imposed barriers, editorial independence should be preserved. Transparency, accountability, and truthful reporting should also be safeguarded in the face of harmful mis- and disinformation. This problem has been significantly aggravated in the past few years on issues ranging from COVID-19 to the ongoing war in Ukraine, we have witnessed an exponential increase in the dissemination of fake and misleading content, exploiting the huge demand for information and warping our understanding. To confront some of these challenges, the United Nations launched Verified, an initiative aimed at delivering trusted, fact-based information. We recognize that an informed world is an empowered world. We must work collectively to ensure there are no barriers to equitable access to accurate information. And together, we can help ensure that those who dedicate their lives to informing and educating us can do their jobs safely and without repercussions. And now, without further ado, I am pleased to begin the high-level segment of today's event. To start, it is my honor to introduce a video message from the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres. It is a pleasure to address this virtual event of the General Assembly to mark World Press Freedom Day. On World Press Freedom Day, we shine a spotlight on the essential work of journalists and other media workers who seek transparency and accountability from those in power, often at great personal risk. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, many media workers have been on the front lines providing accurate science-based reporting to inform decision makers and save lives. At the same time, journalists who cover climate, biodiversity and pollution have succeeded in bringing global attention to this triple planetary crisis. But the threats to the freedom of journalists and media workers are growing by the day. From global health to the climate crisis, corruption and human rights abuses, they face increased politicization of their work and attempts to silence them from many sides. Digital technology has democratized access to information, but it has also created serious challenges. 
The business model of many social media platforms are based not on increasing access to accurate reporting, but on increasing engagement, which often means provoking outrage and spreading lies. Media workers in war zones are threatened not only by bombs and bullets, but by the weapons of falsification and disinformation that accompany modern warfare. They may be attacked as the enemy, accused of espionage, detained or killed, simply for doing their jobs. Digital technology also makes censorship even easier. Many journalists and editors around the world are at constant risk of their programs and reports being taken offline. And digital technology creates new channels for oppression and abuse. Women journalists are at particular risk of online harassment and violence. UNESCO found that nearly three in four women respondents had experienced online violence. Hacking and illegal surveillance also prevent journalists from doing their jobs. The methods and tools change, but the goal of discrediting the media and covering up the truth remains the same as ever. And the results are also the same. People and societies that are unable to distinguish fact from fiction and can be manipulating in horrifying ways. Without freedom of the press, there are no real democratic societies. Without freedom of the press, there is no freedom. The United Nations is working to support journalists and media workers everywhere. Ten years ago, we established a plan of action on the safety of journalists to protect media workers and then the impunity for crimes committed against them. On World Press Freedom Day, we honor the essential work of the media in speaking truth to power, exposing lies, and building strong, resilient institutions and societies. We call on governments, media organizations, and technology companies everywhere to support these crucial efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary General, for your words of strength and support for journalists across the world, many of whom risk their lives in pursuit of the truth. I would now like to present our next speaker, His Excellency Mr. Abdullah Shahid, President of the 76th Session of the United Nations General Assembly. Excellencies and friends, I begin by thanking Ms. Melissa Fleming and the Secretary General for Global Communications for graciously inviting me to address this virtual meeting in observation of World Press Freedom Day. Today we reflect on what we can do better collectively to defend free expression and protect press freedoms. These sentiments were at the forefront during the high-level dialogue of the World Press Freedom Day Global Conference, where I participated on the 3rd of May. I was honored to issue a joint statement on the safety of journalists alongside the President of the Conference of UNESCO and the President of the Human Rights Council commemorating the 2022 World Press Freedom Day. The existence of free and independent journalism has always been critical for democracies to thrive and prosper. Journalists render invaluable services to our societies. They raise the public's awareness. They focus and analyze critical issues. They speak truth to power and hold governments accountable. And by doing so, they help strengthen our democracies. In recent years, journalism has undergone several transformations. These transformations have largely stemmed from revolutionary advances in technology that are still ongoing. While this has brought about many benefits, including in terms of information sharing and news gathering, there's also a darker side. The same transformations have made it increasingly easy for journalists to be put under greater surveillance, jeopardize their privacy and independence. In our increasingly digital world, there are also increasingly targets of online hate which can often escalate into physical violence. In the most tragic instances, this can even lead to death. It is important that we create political spaces in which free expression and the robust exchange of ideas can thrive. Societies in which people live in fear of speaking their minds are societies that will fall prey to stagnation. Journalists 
remain our first line of defense in upholding the liberties we cherish and in protecting the fundamental principles of our democracies. In turn, we owe it to them to keep them safe, both offline and online. We can do this by ending impunity for crimes against journalists and by ensuring that advances in digital technology and communications are properly regulated and not misused to target and harness and harass journalists or anyone for that matter. By protecting journalists, we protect our freedoms, we protect our societies, and we protect ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your remarks and insights. I am now delighted to introduce His Excellency, Mr. Nikos Dendias, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Hellenic Republic, or Greece, who will speak to us on behalf of co-chair of the Group of Friends for the Protection of Journalists. On the occasion of the 29th Annual World Press Freedom Day, it's my honor to address today's event. An event organized by the United Nations Department of Global Communications in partnership with UNESCO. The esteemed participants' work in promoting fundamental freedoms and human rights is remarkable. They include the right of freedom of opinion and expression as well as press freedom. The theme of this year's event, Digital Journalism Under Siege, is pertinent and timely. Fast-moving and ever-evolving technological developments are a blessing and a concern. On the one hand, they signify progress and advancement. On the other, they require adequate regulation, ensuring full respect of rights and punishment of their violations. The combination of such actions is achievable in democratic countries and inclusive societies, where rights and obligations are organized in a complementary manner. With a view to safeguarding freedom of the press and viability of the media, protection of journalism in general in order to keep the public informed on latest developments is imperative, especially in times when fake news and disinformation proliferate we must all work together to address the worrying trends and serious consequences of such irresponsible practices. Unfortunately, recent developments such as the war in Ukraine are adding to previous actions contrary to fundamental freedoms and human rights. In closing, I would like to assure you that Greece, a strong supporter of freedom of the press, remains committed to collaborating with partners at the United Nations General Assembly on the resolution for the safety of journalists and the issue of impunity, at the Human Rights Council on the resolution for the safety of journalists, at the United Nations Group of Friends of the Protection of Journalists, and in other relevant initiatives in UNESCO and beyond on projects that promote democracy, peace and freedom. Your Excellency, thank you for your remarks and for your country's support to the work of the Group of Friends for the Protection of Journalists. I now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Christian Espinoza Canizares, Chairperson of the 44th Session of the Committee on Information and Permanent Representative of Ecuador to the United Nations to make his remarks. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues and friends, the importance of the free flow of knowledge and information cannot be overstated. Without them, no sound opinions can be formed and therefore no informed decisions can be made. Evidently, an uninformed decision is frequently a wrong one. Since 1993, the United Nations has celebrated the 3rd of May as World Press Freedom Day to highlight the importance of a free press for the dissemination of knowledge and information to reflect on the respect of such freedom and also to remember those who lost their lives due to their work as journalists. It is regrettable and sad that 29 years later, journalists and media workers still face threats and attacks for doing their job. Our collective ability to access information and make informed decisions is also facing new challenges. Online communications have taken over the world in the last decades, and our latest outcome documents, such as the Winwick 
plus 30 declaration on information as a public good duly proclaim that freedoms must be respected both online and offline. Accordingly, the theme of this year commemoration event, Journalism under Digital Siege, acknowledges the impact that surveillance and hacking have in thwarting freedom of the press, the need for transparency of internet companies, and the erosion of public trust that undermines media viability. In 2013, UNESCO's resolution on internet-related issues already declared that, I quote, privacy is essential to protect journalistic sources, which enable a society to benefit from investigative journalism to strengthen good governance and the rule of law, and such privacy should not be subject to arbitrary or unlawful interference. End of quote. We must make every effort to ensure that journalists are protected from breaches of privacy in order to safeguard their work, which is crucial to create public awareness and ensure accountability. Without professional journalists and media organization, access to reliable information would be impossible. We live in a time where everyone with a smartphone can broadcast content to a wide audience. Information has never been more accessible, but its reliability and credibility have never been more questioned. Reliability and credibility are sources of trust, and trust is one of the main assets and responsibilities of the media. Safeguarding the ability of journalists to provide trustworthy information is therefore a necessary measure to avoid living in a world of fake news and bad decisions. All of us should do our part to tackle this information, protect journalists, and aim for greater transparency. My country, Ecuador, is committed to do so and is currently working on an improved legal framework to safeguard freedom of the press. The United Nations also has an important role. And as the chair of the UN Committee on Information, I am pleased that we can contribute to these objectives through our work. Finally, I would like to recognize UNESCO, the Government of Uruguay, and the Department of Global Communications for organizing this year's commemoration of World Press Freedom Day. I thank you. Thank you, Excellency, for your statement. It is now my pleasure to announce Ms. Valeria Robeco, President of the UN Correspondents Association. Mr. Secretary General, Mr. President of the General Assembly, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, since the start of the war in Ukraine, dozens of journalists, TV operators and photographers have been killed, injured, threatened, robbed or kidnapped, and the list grows as the conflict continues. Lives lost and sacrificed for the truth, with this being just the most recent example of what has been an ongoing threat against members of the media. According to the latest UN data, 55 journalists and media professionals were killed last year, with nearly 9 in 10 killings since 2006 still unresolved. Although the number of victims stand at its lowest for a decade, UNESCO underlined the many dangers that reporters face in trying to cover stories and expose wrongdoing, and revealed how impunity is alarmingly widespread. During times of crisis, such as the war in Ukraine or the COVID-19 outbreak, it is even more important that the public have access to reliable and timely information, and that journalists have a key role to play in defending the rights to freedom of expression. As the Secretary General reminds us, press freedom is vital for peace, justice and human rights, and he urges countries to investigate and prosecute crimes against them with the full force of the law. We stand in solidarity with those members of the media who find themselves in difficult situations throughout the world, and those three among us have the duty to hold up the flame of truth in honor of all those who are regularly threatened, killed, intimidated, harassed, arbitrarily arrested, or injured. 
Over the past decades, the news media landscape has changed profoundly. Internet on one hand helps diffusion, but on the other hand, it encourages the creation of niche areas that not only disinform, but reinforce prejudices. There has been a critical increase in the reach of journalism and social media through digital sources, but at the same time, fake news is accelerating and lessens public trust in our work. Not to mention the manipulation of social media and its use as a weapon of mass disruption of which ultimately authentic and transparent information becomes the victim itself. Also, facing the dissemination of fake news is an imperative for journalism and it is a getaway to prove the importance of new and traditional media and its ability to provide verifiable information for public interest. At a time when disinformation and mistrust of the news media is growing, a free press is essential. The World Press Freedom Day acts a reminder to governments of the need to respect their commitment to press freedom and to the international community to help those people who are denied the right of access to information. Authoritarian regimes continue to tighten their grip on media organizations, but journalists in democratic and free nations are also under threat. IECO passed appeals by the Secretary General in calling for governments to protect journalists and to strengthen press freedom. But once again, I ask the United Nations to take a step forward in addressing the protection of members of the press all over the world by appointing a special representative for the protection of journalists, a key figure that can no longer be ignored within the debate on freedom and accuracy of information. Thank you. Over the past Over five the years, 85% of the world's population have experienced a decline in press freedom in their country. During the same period, 400 journalists have been killed while doing their job. In addition, global newspaper advertising revenues have dropped by half, severely threatening the survival of media outlets. These threats to the free exercise of journalism as explored in the latest edition of UNESCO World Trans Report on Freedom of Expression and Media Development have been further exacerbated by the rise of new technologies. While these technologies allow us to access more news than ever before, they expose us to disinformation and hate speech. They also raise new challenges to our privacy and personal data protection, with digital surveillance techniques being used by different actors in violation of the rights to privacy and freedom of expression. The digital sphere has provided the new tools to those who wish to silence free expression, dissent, and investigations into wrongdoings. We have seen an increase in digital attacks, especially against women journalists. Journalism is today under digital siege, an issue so pressing that it has inspired the overall theme of the World Press Freedom Day 2022. It is therefore essential to ensure workable technological and regulatory solutions so that journalists can exercise their profession safely with their sources protected and that we preserve our collective right to know, to express ourselves and to protect privacy. Last year, the participants in the World Press Freedom Day conference adopted the Windhoek Plus 30 declaration on information as a public good. The principles of this declaration have since been endorsed unanimously by UNESCO member states. However, to ensure that information and journalism remain public goods, we must work together to protect the rights of journalists and media professionals to work freely and safely. In this regard, as we mark this year the 10th anniversary of the UN Plan of Action, on the safety of journalists and the issue of impunity, we need to increase our efforts and intensify our cooperation. Last year, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and for the first time ever, the Global World Press Freedom Conference connected most of the celebrations around the world through one virtual commemoration. This year, with the improvement of the sanitary conditions, 
we are returning to multiple celebrations and discussions around the world, both in person and virtually. On this WordPress Freedom Day 2022, I invite you all to reflect upon the opportunities and challenges facing press freedom in the digital era. I'm convinced that through joint efforts, we can together overcome these challenges as to ensure a future in which information remains as a public good to the benefit of all people. I would like to thank all the speakers we heard from in this high-level segment of today's celebration. We will now proceed to the interactive panel discussion on media, viability, and public trust. Before handing it over to our moderator for this segment, Mr. Guy Berger, Director for Strategies and Policies, Communication and Information at UNESCO, I would like to extend a warm welcome to the distinguished panelists taking part in the interactive discussion. We look forward to hearing your diverse perspectives on media viability and public trust in the ever-evolving digital era. Mr. Berger, over to you. Hello. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa Fleming. Hello from Punta del Este here in Uruguay. Uh, I'm at the Global World Press Freedom Conference, and uh, Uruguay has sent a, a, an important signal to the world about its strong commitment to press freedom by hosting this event. And as we talk, there is a session wrapping up this conference, which has been going for three days. It's called How to Walk the Talk about making information as a public good. There have been about a thousand people here in person. Uh, there have been people from 86 countries. There have been 70 sessions. My voice is a bit hoarse as a result. And we've had 2,000 people remotely. <clears throat> Elsewhere, there have been many other events in Addis, uh, in Arusha, Phnom Penh, uh, in Mongolia, many other countries around the world. And the major media around the world has carried this message about press freedom and the need to act against journalism under digital siege. Let me tell you quickly some of the achievements here in, in the past few days. First, the UNESCO Guillermo Cano World Press Freedom Prize was issued. This is a unique prize in the UN system. And it was given this year to the Belarus Association of Journalists. In addition, as was mentioned earlier uh, by the President of the UN General Assembly, His Excellency Abdullah Shahid, we had an unprecedented get together of the presidents of the General Assembly of the Human Rights Council and of UNESCO to issue a statement in this whole area of safety of journalists. Then we had the Organization of American States launching a group of friends of safety of journalists. There was a joint session I think possibly historic, between the Freedom Online Coalition and the Media Freedom Coalition. From the UNESCO side, we launched two chapters in a study about the safety of women journalists online. And these are positive chapters because they talk about what newsrooms are doing and can do more, and also what the tech platforms can do to protect women journalists. These are available online. And also, we launched two policy briefs from UNESCO, one about protecting whistleblowers, particularly in this digital age, and the other one is about the economic viability of media, which is called Finding the Funds for Journalism to Thrive. This brings me to reflect briefly that World Press Freedom Day came out of the Vintuk Conference in 1991, a conference on free, pluralistic, and independent media. And that led to a call for World Press Freedom Day that was endorsed by the General Assembly and by UNESCO. Well, last year was the Vintuk Plus 30 conference, and they added to freedom, pluralism, and, in, and independence three more things we have to pay attention to. Media viability, transparency of internet companies, and building resilience and media and information literacy amongst audiences. So here we are today following up that theme of looking at, in particular, media viability, because in this session, we want to explore how digital threats have included threats to many, many of media enterprises around the world. Media enterprises have found themselves lacking data, and data is the name of the game now, 
lacking data scientists, uh, lacking cloud storage, lacking artificial intelligence, and in unable to compete with the automated advertising that's going to the big internet companies. What do you do in a case like this? Because the situation is grim. Jobs are being lost, media outlets are closing. Some media uh, is able to survive through subscriptions to wealthy, well-heeled audiences, but what about everybody else? Um, how do we not only save the existing media, but grow it and transform it to be more inclusive and more representative and serve audiences who don't have journalism in their local languages that's independent, credible, trustworthy. So that's what we're going to talk about in this panel. And we have a wonderful group of, of, of experts. And I'm not going to introduce them all. Immediately, I'll introduce them as they're going to speak. So let me start off and introduce you to Michelle Ferrier. Michelle Ferrier, Dr. Michelle Ferrier, she's Dean of the School of Journalism and Graphic Communication at Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, she is the uh, Executive Director of the Media Innovation Collaboratory, which is an incubator for media and tech solutions. And she's also founder of a, an initiative called Trollbusters, which, as you can imagine from the name, is trying to deal with those who are trolling journalists and human rights defenders, and particularly women um, journalists and human rights defenders. Uh, Michelle, please uh, let us have your remarks, and then I'll ask you a question after that, and we'll move into the other speakers. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you, dear colleagues in the human rights sphere, colleagues here at the United Nations and scholars and journalists and digital rights defenders around the globe. Thank you, Guy Berger from UNESCO for the invitation to this very critical event and time here, not only in the United States, but around the globe. I'm Dr. Michelle Ferrier, the former Dean of the School of Journalism and Graphic Communication at Florida a &M University and a full professor there, as well as the executive director of the Media Innovation Collaboratory, where we look at and examine digital culture, internet communication technologies and innovations at the local level for news and information. Thank you for this invitation, especially uh, because over the last 20 years, I've conducted work and research into these digital spaces, into ICTs and the impact of these social tools on journalism and the digital sphere. I'm here to address the tipping point today upon which we now sit as citizens, as journalists, and as scientists and scholars, and our ability to be able to help ourselves as well as the general population use our critical skills to seek, learn, grow, and develop democracies where all humans have the right to be and thrive. But that growth, those dreams for many, are curtailed today because of the lack of trust in journalists, our public sphere, has become tainted, toxic, and hostile to journalists and truth tellers. Digital narratives, misinformation and disinformation, reframing are all designed to confuse and create fear and separation in our digital and public sphere. Well-funded, coordinated campaigns by political bad actors, religious groups, uh, misogynistic groups and others seek to destroy the reputation of individual journalists and media brands and to keep citizens journalists off balance and unable to act powerfully around the most critical global issues that we face such as climate change, racial reckoning, as well as the continued war and abuses of human rights around the globe. Their targets, these journalists, are oftentimes women journalists and journalists of color who are reporting on marginalized communities at the local level. They're experiencing an unprecedented level of attack over these past five years and even more, targeting journalists at the intersection of their professional and personal identities as humans, as women, as people of color, 
as gender and religious differences come to the forefront. They are targeted for these behaviors and targeted in their intimate relationships because of the work that they do. I applaud the intentions of our global efforts to map and make visible the activity that oftentimes happens behind the scenes. And because of our own professional culture as journalists, we are oftentimes loath to describe to the public the very vile and violent ways in which we come under attack, not only through digital harms, but then translating that into physical space where we ourselves come under attack, our devices and our data are destroyed, and our sources and relationships to our communities are tattered. Digital journalism under siege is an apt theme to demonstrate how on multiple levels we must address the right to free speech, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, and the right to be. Journalists by nature of our work oftentimes carry critical truths to the world that even despite the best intention, don't make it past the regulatory bodies even joined here today and into the solutions. The voices of women journalists, journalists of color, those who are trans and don't represent in the binaries that we often put into our global narratives are being silenced, censored, and are disappearing off of our platforms. They're being jailed, exiled, their publications shut down. And our newsrooms themselves oftentimes are retaliating against the journalists themselves bringing these stories and coming under attack for being in that public eye. And they're coming under siege as soon as they step outside their homes to do their work. We cannot wait for billionaires and their toys du jour to have the global power to destroy the free press and challenge the abuses of power. We must have digital platforms ethically develop technologies to provide redress for digital harms in a speedy and expedient manner so that the burden of, of dealing with online harassment doesn't fall to the individual. We must help journalists and create the support to the, allow them to continue to do their work online and off. We need more, greater media plurality to bear witness and share these local truths so that we, ensure, that we may ensure freedom of expression and free speech around the globe. We must solve for the greatest impact to women and journalists of color around the globe bringing the stories and lived experiences of our world's most vulnerable and most marginalized and at risk to an international stage. We must support them in bringing stories that we would not otherwise hear so that they continue to bear witness and bring a free press to the globe. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michelle Ferrier. Um, I, I have a quick follow-up question. I, I'd like to make the link between what you said and the question of economic viability, because clearly the weaker the press is, the less it's able to protect press freedom, its journalists, the less able it is to keep its independence, the less able it is to do the kind of transformation that you were speaking about, about uh, greater diversity, greater equality. In what way can addressing issues of freedom and safety of women journalists play into this economic question? How would it help media pay their bills if they accelerated their representativeness in terms of women leadership, uh, minorities, uh, people from other languages, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Over to you, if you could answer mm -hmm. in two minutes, thanks. Sure. Um, one of the things that we have been doing here in the United States and uh, with colleagues around the globe is helping inside of our journalism programs as well as outside of those journalism programs 
to help both our newsrooms as well as independent journalists look at ways to create viability at the local level. Um, some of those solutions have been from creating cooperatives of uh, media entities that work together to distribute the workload as well as distribute resources at the local level. We've also uh, looked at and supported journalists to create their own entrepreneurial ventures where we're helping them look at a variety of avenues at the local level for revenue um, beyond advertising, which has been the traditional revenue of sorts for these areas. And our goal is through media plurality to actually let a thousand flowers bloom and go beyond the traditional newsroom and uh, the, the marker of a newsroom as a healthy media ecology. Um, in the research that I do around media deserts, which is mapping and modeling local news ecosystems, print, online, um, and distributed through other forms, broadcast, et cetera, we're looking at a combination of types of and multiple vectors of information so that people are not um, in a filter bubble created by algorithms, created by uh, single source news in their communities, and have the benefit of local situated knowledge of their own of their own residents and neighbors alongside of the official information that might be right. coming from official sources in those communities. And so we're looking at and providing avenues for people to imagine differently and better about the ways that we might provide a deep service at the local level to mm -hmm. these communities so that they may engage in conversation and learning and dialogue and action around the issues most pressing to those regions. Right, right. That's so important because as you mentioned, there are these news deserts and they're partially geographical, but even in big cities, many people experience a desert. They don't have journalism that serves them, tells their stories, has uses their languages and we have to address that because we're in a world where it's mission critical let's move can on I, and we'll come back to you I, just really quickly i'm going to okay. challenge you on the use of news deserts um, my research uses the term media deserts and it's for a particular reason because media deserts looks at the complex at the code conduct and content and conduit layers not news as a marketplace and consumers as audiences, but looking through the lens of journalism and news as a service to communities to help mm -hmm. communities thrive. And that's a critical lens to thinking about the solutions that we must have at a global level to solving for this problem at the local level. And so Media Deserts is a okay. critical frame to help us to develop appropriate solutions. Right. Thank you. Well, th thank you for that insight. So our next speaker is uh, Ms. Sir Kitty Duiverdi. She's a senior correspondent at New Delhi Television, which is one of the um, leading news providers in India. She's covered a lot, uh, the whole COVID crisis, including the oxygen crisis in India. She's covered issues of mob lynching, of riots, of gender discrimination. So, uh, uh, Sir Katie, please let us have your insights into this question. Journalism under digital siege. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would just like to thank the UNESCO for this opportunity. Uh, now, coming on to the topic of the discussion, uh, since I am a reporter in India, I would first like to talk about the media landscape that I come from and then what we face as ground reporters during our assignments because of the environment that we are operating in currently. Uh, now, if you look at the way media has deteriorated in India in the past few years, it is all the more astonishing because it is not like we have a few media organizations, but we are a country that has over 100,000 newspapers and magazines and over 300 television news channels. But despite being the world's largest democracy, uh, when yesterday the Press Freedom Index uh, rankings were issued, we stood at 150. We've uh, declined eight ranks from where we stood at 142, uh, 142 in the year 2021. Uh, according to the report, we are one of the world's most dangerous countries uh, for journalists. Uh, the factors that it has attributed all of this conclusion to is that uh, there is violence against journalists, 
uh, there is a politically partisan media and there is concentration of media ownership and three to four journalists are killed every year. In the year 2021, four journalists were killed in India. Uh, but if you look at how the government is responding to such reports and the scenario, uh, while the government has not reacted to this latest report, in the last year when we stood at 142, the government said that uh, was in a denial mood about the report. It said that uh, the methodology of uh, compiling this report is wrong. Their uh, numbers, survey numbers are very low. There is no transparency in the process of compiling this report. But this is the same government that is known for filing sedition cases and police complaints against journalists. Tomorrow, the top court of India is going to hear a case that has been filed by the Editors Guild of India. It had to finally approach the top court of India to say that we are challenging the constitutional validity of the entire sedition law and the way these police complaints are being filed against journalists. Also, this is the same government that is accused of using the Israeli spyware software Pegasus against journalists. This is the same government uh, that imposes internet shutdowns uh, across various parts of India very frequently, which uh, blocks the access that journalists have to information at in very critical situations. Now, if you look at this entire landscape and then the kind of hostile environment in that is created for us uh, in our workspaces and when we go on the ground, uh, one, uh, the kind of misinformation that is going around on social media, any journalist who's critical of the government is labeled as anti-national. Uh, then there are coordinated hate campaigns on social media, the kind that Michelle was referring to, where we are abused, especially if you're a woman journalist, you get rape threats, you get death threats, uh, any news reports that we do, edited clippings from it that do not present the whole picture, they are circulated on Twitter, they are circulated over WhatsApp to create a misconception about us. And then how does that really affect when I go out as a ground reporter to report in extreme situations? For example, I reported on the religious riots that took place in the national capital, New Delhi, in February 2020. And then in situations like those, I face dual challenges in a country like India. One, I am just on what my religious identity is, whether I'm a Hindu or I'm a Muslim. So the uh, mob of rioters uh, that I will come across is going to be judged, is going to judge me on what religion I'm from, but also the media organization that I am from. Uh, the situations become so extreme that several reporters across media organizations had to remove the IDs that are there on the top of our microphones or the mics that we use. We had to remove those IDs so that one cannot make out which media organization we are from. So it has become that difficult for journalists to operate in India. Uh, even political rallies, we can't report in political rallies properly because uh, all media organizations are set to support uh, are supposed to have certain political leanings. So there are already impressions that one particular media organization is either going to support the right or conservative political parties or the other one, other media organizations are going to support the leftist political parties or the more liberal ones. Uh, or even in routine stories that we do, for example, if I'm supposed to report on a government welfare scheme, it becomes difficult because no government officials will pick up my phones or respond to my messages. And that prevents uh, my capability to present a balanced picture of the story or seek a accountability, ask them questions, all of that capability is hindered because of this entire scenario. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Sukirti. That was very vivid. Um, thank you for giving us those insights. Let me do the same as I did with Michelle Ferrier. Um, come back to the linking the, the other pressures to the e economic pressures, because these are this is something new with digital. And my question to you is, if broadcasters like yours lose advertising to the internet companies, as happened with the print media, what would be the alternative ways to fund broadcasting um, in your country, they, whereby you know, you, your salary could be paid? Would it be through crowdfunding? Would it be through selling fact-checking services? Was there a market to pay for subscriptions to your, to your media? How do you deal with this digital challenge of advertising moving away from print and broadcasting? Oh, well, revenues, especially in terms of the Indian media landscape, is a big challenge because uh, in terms of Indian newspapers, they derive at least 66% of their revenues from advertisements alone. And similarly, television news channels depend for uh, 
advertisements with about 71% of their revenues are driven by those so only about 30% of their revenues are driven by subscriptions so in india in a country which has most of the population where it's low income or middle income population that earns only about 428 dollars per month uh, people are not willing to pay for journalism so while uh, the independent news media outlets they are trying two options at this point of time one of course is subscriptions and the other is crowdfunding these two models are at a very nascent stage in india uh, and in the in our in our population people might not be as willing to go for monthly subscriptions because that will burn a big hole in their pockets when they take out that chunk from their monthly income but a certain model that has worked to a certain extent uh, is a, a business journalism website like the ken is an example of that it started out with india now covers southeast asia it makes you pay per story so you're not taking a monthly subscription but you like an article and you pay just specifically for that article that model is working for them and uh, that is the kind of model certain other uh, web portals especially in india are beginning to try that model but uh, for the mainstream uh, of course organizations <laughs> and both television channels uh, it is a big challenge and uh, subscriptions are uh, while they are an alternative uh, it is difficult for a country like india for people to actually go for that option a very quick follow up india of course is very famous for its tech industry and what is the capacity of indian media to hire data scientists to collect data, to analyze it, to use it, to give better audience services, to sell advertising, to compete with the big um, internet companies. Is, is there possibility there? Or is the media so far behind that's not an option? Well, as far as hiring data scientists is concerned to try and assess, you know, what their audience is capable of spending or what is their audience really looking for that is concerned. One, you know, there are certain countries where the government is spending in that sector to try and assess that entire situation so that they can give tax subsidies accordingly to media organizations. Mm -hmm. Here, the government is completely uh, anti-media, so they are not going to go for that option. And if you look at the private media organizations, uh, the ones that lean towards the government they have a lot of money but it is likely to be spent more on promotional events and award ceremonies that they hold on a monthly basis than in trying to actual do data assessment of who their audience is uh, most of the surveys that are done in India to assess the audience, it's mainly uh, dependent on television news ratings, how many people are watching us. And that's the only number that drives how they are going to spend the money in the mm -hmm. upcoming year. Mm -hmm. So television news ratings, number of viewers that we have, and that's the pretty much the only scenario that they take care of. But beyond that, it is very unlikely that private media organizations in India will spend uh, specifically on data scientists or any kind of number crunching to assess their audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you for those insights. So we're going to move on to our next speaker now, um, and we'll come back to you uh, a bit later, Security. Um, but now we have Nishant Lalwani. He's the vice president of the Luminate Foundation. He leads the global strategies for funding independent media, uh, particularly looking, for example, at innovative uh, fi in innovative financing models for media. So you're really at the, you know, the, 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 the base level of how does media survive um, in addition to all the political and other problems, but at the economic level. Nishant, what's your insight into this? Thank you so much, Guy. Um, I'm really delighted to be on this panel, um, especially as it, as it was like a year ago today that on a panel organized by Melissa Fleming uh, with the UN Secretary General present, we received the support from him, um, from the UNSG for the International Fund for Public Interest Media, or IPIM, um, which we believe is actually a major new initiative to be able to tackle uh, media viability issues. Um, in fact, at this time last year, in the run up to World Press Freedom Day, he warned of the consequences for democracy and development of the crisis confronting independent media around the world. Uh, in doing so, he lent his support uh, to the creation of a new global fund, which I'm honoured to have co-founded with the support uh, of Luminate Group. In fact, he urged member states, donors and other stakeholders to support the International Fund for Public Interest Media, which he called a vital new endeavour. I need to pay tribute to, to the advice and insight and the highly constructive engagement um, we've had with UNESCO, um, as well as UNDP colleagues in developing this initiative 
um, both then and now. You know, last, world, last year's World Press Freedom Day focused on information as a public good. That concept, which has now been endorsed, of course, by UNESCO's General Assembly following the historic um, Windhoek uh, Plus 30 statement, is, is really critical to the way we think about independent journalism and the way that we need to think about it. Uh, because independent, accurate journalism is a public good. And what normally happens when there's a market failure for a public good, when there's a market failure, for example, in healthcare or in education or in vaccines more recently, well, the state steps in. Uh, but it's hard to do that for media because funding uh, journalism is considered to be so political. And that's why we created IFPIM as a, a truly independent multilateral global fund that could direct large scale resources, including those from government, towards resolving the market failure, which is affecting our democracies. A market failure, which is allowing disinformation to thrive and autocracies to, to spread. Yesterday, we were able to announce the first funding round um, of the International Fund for Public Interest Media. We announced an initial open call available to public media institutions and yeah, public interest media institutions in 17 countries, that is independent news organizations. Um, although we're not yet fully established as an entity ourselves, we decided to open this call as soon as we could because we are in a position to make some resources available and because we know that the catastrophic economic situation confronting independent media around the world continues to intensify. But we need to, to redouble our efforts if we're to generate the resources needed to confront the challenge of media viability. Last year, if PIMS board chair Maria Ressa was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and in her acceptance speech in Oslo, she said this, she said, right now, while journalism is under attack on all fronts, only 0.3% of overseas development assistance is spent on journalism. If we nudge that to 1%, we can raise a billion dollars a year for news organizations. That will be crucial for the global south. But raising additional funding for journalism right now, as we all know, is a challenge. We're only just emerging from a pandemic, which has wreaked immense economic damage on independent media. And as the UNESCO policy brief just published on media funding states, pluralism and democracy need an economically viable independent news media. New research by uh, the Economist and the Economist Impact Unit, supported by UNESCO, um, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, outlined this in 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 crystal clear um, with crystal clear data. And there are five big takeaways for me. One, uh, ten billion in newspaper advertising will be lost to internet advertising in twenty by twenty twenty five. Outlets in low and middle income countries have been the most severely impacted with a rate of decline almost two times faster than the global average. Thirdly, although philanthropy from news did increase sharply uh, in 2020, from about 226 million to 457 million US dollars, over 90% of this went to North American recipients. That means Latin America, uh, Middle East and North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa are expected to be hit hardest by the accelerating digital transformation. New digital revenue is projected to cover just 9% of the loss of print revenue over the next three years uh, in those regions. And, and lastly, given the large fall in funding, philanthropy and government support is going to become more important. Um, and it's for exactly these reasons that we created the International Fund for Public Interest Media. And that's why we focused it on Latin America, and the Caribbean, Africa, Asia, and Eastern Europe. And we've ensured that it's a truly independent multilateral vehicle um, where editorial independence should never be an issue, even with government funding. We do this by having a completely independent government structure that does not have donor representation on the board. And, and that's why we now have uh, commitments, financial commitments from six governments, that is the US, Sweden, Switzerland, uh, France, Taiwan, and Korea, as well as a number of philanthropies. And those funders do not have a say in which media outlets receive support. So, so what are we going to do with this fund and with this money? How are we going to tackle media viability? We are going to both rebuild and sustain independent media in the countries in which we work. How do we rebuild? Well, we'll need new financial models that will allow journalism to survive. survive. And IFPIM will directly fund innovation around business models, financial models, audience engagement, for example. 
We will support new ideas, we'll test what works, and we'll aim to grow, adapt, and then share those models across the world. However, if PIM will also provide core support to sustain independent journalism while other types of innovation take place. For too long, we've put the onus purely on journalists to come up with wholesale solutions for the crisis in media revenue. And business model innovation amongst media outlets is certainly part of the answer here. However, we need others outside the sector to make real change too. We'll need new models of public subsidy. We'll need new models of regulation if we're to get to a new paradigm of journalism. We don't do this. The crisis of democracy and of disinformation will get worse. In fact, there'll be irrevocable damage to our democracies. Right now, autocratic practices and regimes are spreading. It's so painful to see what's happening in Ukraine, but also more subtly and permanently um, in other parts of the world. And reliable public interest journalism sheds a light on what's happening and where power is being abused. Without that, we stand no chance of turning this tide. Because as democratic information spaces empty, which they do without funding, undemocratic space our actors occupy those spaces. And thus, the international community, including international donors, cannot afford for independent media to disappear. And yet that's the threat that we now confront. So today I wanna to call uh, on the journalists and media organizations watching today to step up their advocacy for increased resources to be provided from the international community, from governments, from corporates, from philanthropy. Mobilizing the kind of funding that our board chair, Maria Ressa, is calling for, that is an additional 1% of overseas development assistance or about a billion dollars a year would only happen if there's a clear articulated demand from those who need it. Please do join us in calling for a much more ambitious, concerted and organized response from the international community to support independent media because independent media has never been more important than the survival of democracy. Thank you, Guy. Thank you so much, uh, Nishant. Uh, very sobering but inspiring because of your ambition. You mentioned the 0.3% figure. Um, I'm told that if one actually analyzes it, you find it's even less because some countries are putting their own um, external broadcast services into that figure, um, which is not really media development or media assistance, it's really their own foreign policy. Uh, so we have a, a way to go to encourage countries to really go up to 0.4%, because if it's at the moment 0.2%. Um, I guess a question that I have for you is that there have been people arguing at this Uruguay conference that the polluters should pay. In other words, the big tech, which is making money out of uh, the environment that is demoting journalism, overshadowing it, allowing a tax on it, and at the same time um, funding hate, uh, disinformation, misinformation, that the polluters should pay. Um, to what extent do you think um, there is real recognition on the part of big business that they have an interest in this and they should come into it? Or does it have to come down to regulation? Yeah, I mean, that's the question of the moment, really. Um, I think what we have to recognize is that at the turn of the century, the economics of information and of media fundamentally changed. And we're not going back to a place where, um, you know, we will still get revenue for, from newspapers, from print advertising. Um, that era has gone. Um, you know, much information at that time also became free or other consumers paid for that information with data, with their own data that could be monetized. And so um, really, we uh, uh, at Luminate and the International Fund for Public Interest Media believe that there's essentially three areas of possible solution here for getting to um, a market that works for independent media. One is that, yes, there needs to be innovation around how media organizations raise revenue for themselves. But we've been trying that for 20 years or so um, since these major changes in the market. And there are some green shoots, um, especially around reader revenue, but there aren't um, any silver bullets and we haven't got close to sustainability for most organizations, especially those in the global south. Secondly, we are seeing a great deal of interest in public subsidy models. 
Um, and there's experiments, um, as you know, in France and in Canada and other places. Um, these aren't perfect, they need to be improved, but it is a recognition that accurate information is a public good. And we applaud that. We applaud the attempts to iterate on public subsidy models that can support journalism in those countries. And thirdly, yes, we do need regulation. Um, we do, I don't think um, we, we're in a place where we can rely on corporates to um, provide sufficient support in an equitable manner to independent media uh, in a way that allows that public good to stay public. Um, so I think we are going to need regulation. And I think there's an increasing recognition that especially if uh, you know, independent media is to survive in resource poor environments, um, that we need regulation that will allow for that and will allow either states, um, funds like IFPIM uh, or, or, or other kind of publicly interested um, independent organizations to make the decisions around allocation. Um, so yes, I think it's inevitable. And I think, I think we, we, we have a way to go as to figuring out what the smartest, best type of regulation is. But that's in a way why we've set up the International Fund so that in that period, which will take a good few years to get to good regulation, good subsidy and smart business models, during that period, we won't see further media extinction. As Michelle Ferrier said, this can't wait, uh, the, the whole package of, of threats. Well, let's move on to our, our next and final speaker. Um, it's uh, Ms. Ilsa Hogue, uh, who's the president of the NGO called Purpose. Um, she is a change maker. That's all I can say, reading her, her, her CV. Um, particularly change in regard to saving the planet and also in championing women's rights to choice and rights to reproductive uh, um, self-determination. So uh, Ilsa Hogue, please uh, tell us your insights in this issue. Thank you so much. I want to express my gratitude to my fellow patients, the Secretary General, Melissa Fleming, Guy Berger, and everyone else who put this panel together and prioritized this crucial issue in this moment in time. Um, given my CV, I would be remiss to um, not mention that we are on the precipice of a very perilous time in the United States um, with regard to the fundamental freedom for women to choose our own reproductive destiny. Um, as my colleagues from around the world know, um, lack of access to abortion rights is tantamount to um, you know, keeping women as secondary class status and has implications on everything from their economic potential over the life, their lifetime to their um, educational potential. And so it is with a heavy heart that I address you today. Prior to coming to Purpose, I did a tremendous amount of work in um, exploring journalism, information ecosystems, and disinformation around um, healthcare and reproductive healthcare specifically, and how um, insidious false narratives can lead to bad policy outcomes when it comes to healthcare for women in the United States and around the world. Um, so it was a very attractive prospect for me to join the team at Purpose who really does have an expertise in this kind of information um, ecosystem work as it relates to global health from a broader aperture. Purpose has an organization works to put our analysis into action and uses evidence-based campaigns to continually improve the way we communicate and move people in service of solutions. In 2020, as we all know so well, the world faced a massive public health communications cr crisis as government, civil society, NGOs, multilaterals, and other organizations around the world sought to respond to COVID-19 by equipping their audiences with life-saving health information and engaging them to adopt recommended public health behaviors. Um, during this crisis, it became very, very clear very early on that traditional public health communications were unable to keep pace with the evolving pandemic. The confusion plus the active disinformation made it difficult, if not impossible, to keep vulnerable populations alive, much less informed. 
in so very many parts of the world where the population is already under, underserved, the need for rapid and widely disseminated accurate information was going unmet. And every day this meant more lives were risked and lost as the swirling infodemic, as we call it, a miss and disinformation led to widespread confusion, hesitancy, and fear, with many unsure about what information was accurate or who they could trust. Many organizations, including our friends at the United Nations, wanted to help but did not have the communication tools or experience to cut through this unprecedented crisis. Um, in search of a more effective and dynamic communication strategy that um, was additive in value to the fact checking that was already underway, um, we entered into a unique and what I think was quite a wonderful partnership with the United Nations to mobilize our campaigning expertise and connections that we had already forged to local on the ground community groups and activists. Together, we were able to leverage the our collective existing um, relationships and infrastructure to go on the offensive, flooding the internet with factional, but what we would regard as fairly unconventionally packaged information. I think the foundation of our work was um, what I often refer to as the holy trinity of effective communication strategies when looking at very, very specific audiences that needed to be reached in order to increase vaccine com confidence and counter disinformation, we looked very, very hard at what was the message that would resonate with those audience, who were the messengers that would be trusted in those situations, and what was the vector by which we could most quickly and efficiently get them the messages that they needed, spoken by the messengers that already had trust and veracity in those very specific communities. This was a global campaign. Um, we grew a network of trusted messengers that actually ranged from a wonderful, wonderful group of scientists um, that we titled Team Halo, who we were able to train up to get their very, very crucial, but often very wonky scientific information out on in untraditional venues to them, like TikTok in language and messaging that would be understand by the audiences who most needed it. And we were also um, able to identify existing community leaders in some of these very, very hard pressed um, communities that would um, be able to break through all of the noise quite quickly because they were already known to the constituency that we were trying to reach. Um, we were able to reach over a billion people through this campaign. Um, in a couple of examples, in India, we collaborated with 115 community leaders and about 10,000 rickshaw drivers to disseminate the factual information on preventative measures and vaccine across and vac vaccinations across 24 informal settlements. Vaccine uptake through our evidence-based um, research was 19% higher in communities where the campaign took place. In South Africa, we launched Wakala, a pilot campaign to reach young people with urgent prevention measures and vaccine messaging. And the campaign was so successful there that it was actually scaled by the government to reach a national youth audience. And globally, we were able to in, uh, engage behavioral scientists to launch what we called PAUSE, which was a wraparound campaign that encouraged people to think before sharing information and check other sources, which really reduced the passing along through social media networks of bad information, inaccurate information, or actually intentional disinformation. We truly believe we can continue to save lives by building these powerful networks of trusted messengers, working with partners to reach vulnerable populations with science-backed information. Um, and we also really believe that what we've created, both the infrastructure and the knowledge, can be adapted and exported to other pressing and life-threatening um, crises that we collaboratively face as a globe, including but not limited to gender equity and climate change. So I really want to thank you for your time for this crucial panel today, and it's been an honor to be in this partnership with you all. Thank you so much, Elise. And 
Am I? I'm, I'm fine. Um, <clears throat> we have a question um, which I th from uh, one of the people involved, uh, Nadine Clopton, who's vice president of the Global NGO Executive Committee. Um, she has a question about civil society. And so, uh, Nadine, do you want to pose it quickly? We don't have much time, but if you could then respond in two minutes, um, Elise. Nadine, are you yes. with us? Please. Yes, I am. Hi, hello. Uh, well, thank you for having me today. It's an honor to be here on behalf of the Global NGO Executive Committee. Um, my question just relates to how in our world of intense headlines and compounded complex challenges, can we really focus on what's emerging? And how do we ensure that we grant equitable coverage to stories of healing and solutions? Um, you know, it's imperative we focus on the emergent future we hope to co-create as much as we do on what is breaking down in the world. And uh, secondly, how do we ensure that civil society voices on the ground in their local, social, and ecological contexts are centered as drivers of best practice solutions? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. So Elise, you have loads of experience uh, there. How do you get your messages to stand out uh, amongst the, the, the chaos? And how do you make sure that the civil society voices are, are represented in their full diversity? Yes, thank you, Nadine. And thank you, Guy. I'm going to answer those in reverse order. Um, I think that what we're learning is, in fact, that through, and maybe this converges to questions actually, is that in order to break through, you have to work from a local context of trusted messengers, right? We're no longer living in a world and haven't been for some time as many of my fellow colleagues spoke to where um, there's sort of a handful of sources of information that are covered writ large from global newspapers that then trickle down to sort of local news stations. That's just not it. And so we actually take the entirely reverse approach, which is starting from the community context, starting from understanding who already exhibits influence with the community and working in partnership with them to co-create the kinds of evidence-backed materials that will um, be able to penetrate through the news and be received, the, the glut of news, I should say, and be received because you really trust the person that it's coming from. I think the other part of your question, Nadine, is crucially important. And I'm not sure that we have the entire answer, but I we purpose is absolutely working on this and we would invite everyone else to as well. In addition to a global epidemic of disinformation, we also have a challenge in that on many issues, especially climate, which is something I've spent a lot of my life working on, accurate information is actually incredibly demobilizing for people we need to stay in an active mode to make the change that we need. Does that mean we shouldn't put out accurate information? Absolutely, it does not. Science is important. It needs to be out there. But what it does mean is that when we know something like an IPCC report is coming out, that is going to be terrifying for people and sometimes actually make the problem feel so big that why should we even try? We can actually work to wrap information ecosystems in stories of success, in stories of solution, in stories of early adopters and communities of renewable energy and the benefits of that. So that there Elise, is I, I need to stop you there. Sorry, just because of time. Um, but I think your point is well made. If we had more time, I would love to ask you what lessons your whole campaign has for, for the media and especially for their viability. But we'll have to have you back for another session. So I have a, a question that I think uh, Michelle Ferrier would be in a good position to, to respond. This is a question from Isabel Raventos, Association of Women on Film and Audiovisual Media of Spain. Are you with us, Isabel? Yes. If you can just be quick, two minutes, yeah, please. Yeah, very quick. Well, many thanks to DGC and UNESCO for this event. And I would like to mention that last year at the Generation Equality Forum in Paris, under the proposal of our association and UN Women, 30 women organizations from all over the world launched an alliance of gender equality advocates from film and TV industries to join efforts to end discrimination, fight harmful stereotypes, and achieve transformative uh, change. My question is the following. Uh, how do you think it's possible to accelerate gender equality in freedom of media in terms of priority measures 
and positive actions. Many thanks. Thank you. Michelle, two minutes. Michelle, I don't see your picture. I don't know whether you got cut off. I'm still here. Good, I'm good, please. Great. We now see you. Please uh, so go ahead. First and foremost, in order to accelerate gender equality, we must make sure that all women are at the table when solutions are being designed. Um, I have seen uh, researchers as well as colleagues uh, that represent marginalized communities even within uh, this large group called women um, that have not been brought to the table to have these conversations. And we are the ones that are experiencing the most disparate harms because of this type of activity. And so you see um, online um, the pushback from Black women, Black women journalists, and others in marginalized communities around the globe who are challenging our own so-called allies in this space to make sure that we are representative in our deliberations and that we have the voices of those communities that are most at risk at the table and involved in developing the solutions to this issue. We must have an inclusive solution. And if we continue to disregard and discredit the experiences of those who are experiencing the disproportionate harms, we will continue to see solutions that cannot gain ground because we have not solved for the impunity against these journalists and their families and their work. No, I unmuted it, but Guy, please repeat your question or you're muted. Sorry, thank you so much. Um, we, we're going to move on to a question for uh, uh, Sukirti. And the question comes from Kira Gibson from De Montfort University, UK. Uh, so Kira, you are here, you can pose your question. Hi, yeah. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, my question is, um, during the last few years, uh, the media has been heavily hit on and a lot of places are now deemed to not be credible when telling everyone the news and how news outlets are being hit on for telling stories to celebrities, the people thinking that it's not newsworthy. Um, how will this issue be tackled in the near future to show the masses that journalists are telling the truth and how um, doing so with credible sources that, that the industry doesn't crumble like we are currently seeing it uh, with print and um, not being so often and online being more on um, use. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so Kirti, uh, any response? Uh, well, yes, thanks, Kira. Uh, regarding your question about how do we build back this trust in news organizations and what journalists are saying, um, you know, if I were to just try to see India as a microcosm of that entire situation, uh, a survey that was done uh, by Reuters Institute and the Oxford University recently uh, came out with the conclusion that only about 38% of the people in India trust what is uh, coming up on TV news channels as well as newspapers. So just 38% of the population trusts the work that we do. But, you know, in order to build back trust, what is important is that the audience needs to see impartiality in the work that is going in the newspapers as well as on news channels. And that is that kind of, you know, unbiased reportage is only going to come when these news organizations have the economic freedom to do it. Because in a country where we are so heavily dependent on advertisements, especially most of those coming up from the government itself, and we lose out on those once we become crit critical of the government, uh, it impacts the way our entire you know, uh, functioning is being done economically. So one, we will have to reduce our monetary reliance on these kind of revenue structures and these models and can look up to these solutions that, uh, you know, the esteemed panelists here have been talking about. One, those alternative models are needed. And, you know, even if you look at the kind of uh, reports that have been coming out 
a lot of people have this mistrust especially people coming from the minority communities going by the religious and social tensions in india the minority community especially do not trust what is being shown on news channels people here in india trust more of, of what is going on whatsapp or on social media platforms we have i don't know about other countries but here we have a phrase known as whatsapp university that term is driven by the fact that people are sent forwards to each other on whatsapp and it's become a university of its own where everybody thinks they know more than the other person they have done a doctorate in that particular subject and they are the best voice on it rather than a journalist sitting in a tv studio or one writing a story in a newspaper so in this kind of scenario you will have to also combat misinformation that is going on there are certain portals in india that are doing their job for example alt news or boom live they are combating all of these uh, misinformation especially in cases of mob lynchings religious tension incidents they are finding out what the truth is and they are putting that out to uh, combat all of these social media forwards so those kind of one economic freedoms are needed and then combating this information i think when we do well on both of these fronts we will be able to get back trust that is what i would like to hope even though india stands at 150 right now out of 180 countries but you know as a journalist in india i would still want to you know be resilient and have a ray of hope somewhere in my head mm -hmm. okay well nishant uh, there's a question that i think is suitable from for you and i'm not sure if buzzler rahman is with us buzzler if you are with us can you can you jump in otherwise i'll read the question okay i don't think he's here but anyway he's from the ngos network for radio and communication in bangladesh and his question uh, nishant is in the era of the fourth industrial revolution which by the way is a term i hate <laughs> but anyway, he uses it in the era of the fourth industrial revolution how has that impacted press freedom so it's yeah He's making these connections um, over to you thank you um well what we know about press freedom in the last few years we know that in the last five years 85 percent of the world's population has experienced uh, a decline in population which is sorry a decline in press freedom which is really staggering 85 percent of the world's population um we also know that 57 laws and regulations have been adopted to limit freedom of expression uh, in, in in 44 countries in the same time period these are things like sort of fake news laws adopted in, in, in a number of countries so what this tells me and this is a, this, this is obvious to, to to all of us really is that the utopian dream that we had at the turn, at the turn of the century which was that the internet could truly democratize voice could massively boost freedom of expression that has not been realized and it's certainly not been realized uh, for journalists but that's because autocratic leaders have harnessed technology, frankly, much more powerfully than democratic leaders and societies have. Um, you know, Maria Ressa, co-chair of IFPIM's board, was one of the first thinkers in the world to truly recognize this. She hails from the Philippines, of course, and uh, which has the, the highest rate of per capita social media usage in the world, in any country in the world. And back in 2016, this is before the Trump election, uh, before Trump won his, his, his election, he wrote a series called The Weaponization of Information, information that, that recognized the impact that propaganda was having um, on um, press freedom and on democracy. And we didn't act. We simply didn't do enough to safeguard journalists back then um, or allow them to keep working. Um, but we can. And we can um, if we think about creating safety in numbers. Taking the Philippines, um, continuing with that example, that there simply aren't enough independent media organizations in the Philippines. Um, and that's because there isn't the funding to support them. Right now, there's Rappler's, there's one or two others speaking truth to power. Um, and it's much easier to silence a single journalist or a single organization than it is to silent, silence a diverse independent media ecosystem. Um, to silence a number of voices. And so if we can actually increase the amount of funding available to journalism, then we can increase the reality of press freedom. It'll go from being theoretical to being a reality. That's a concrete step that we can take today. Freedom House's 2010-22 report on, on, on freedom in the world shows that uh, global democratic decline has now been um, uh, 
has, the trend has been continuing for 16 years of democratic decline. And we're just talking about 1% of foreign aid here to be able to, to meaningfully reverse that trend. And, and that's why we've created IFPIM to, to help make that goal a reality, to be able to mm -hmm. support independent media and make press and reverse the trend of declining press freedom. Right. So in a nutshell, in response to Buzzler's question, um, we can't um, take technology out of context and think it's going to be the solution for journalism. We need all these other things. Uh, I think that's your, your message. And particularly, we need funny money, money. So it's time to wrap up. <clears throat> um, I think it's become very clear that the question of press freedom on the one hand and economic viability on the other in the digital age are, are really essential complements. Because if you have press freedom, but no viability, well, you've got an, an empty shell. And if you've got no press freedom, but you've got viability, well, then you don't have journalism because it's not free to do what it's supposed to do. So we really need to pay attention to both of these. Uh, I want to thank you all because I think that's an important takeaway that uh, we can get coming out of this. As if our challenges weren't enough for the press freedom level, we also have this economic viability level. Um, I would like to just uh, mention this publication that you, Nishant, uh, uh, referenced, uh, UNESCO publication released here in Uruguay, Finding the Funds for Journalism to Thrive. It's short, 16 pages. Uh, if you want to find out more about this question, I really recommend that to you. That's on the UNESCO website, Finding the Funds for Journalism to Survive. And the other thing, which also relates to my question to you, Nishant, not to put the spotlight on you, but... Uh, our Director General, Audrey Azule, announced here in Uruguay that we will have a, a conference uh, in February next year on digital regulation, which fits into the overall interest uh, and announcement by the UN Secretary General to develop a global digital compact to be adopted at the summit of the future in September next year. So these are hot topics, and I give you my commitment that UNESCO is engage with these and we'll do what we can. We have 193 member states, not all, just, not all are in agreement, obviously, but we will do what we can to build some kind of consensus that the world needs to address press freedom and economic viability if we want to achieve the sustainable development goals. With that, uh, we one minute over time. I think this was really rich and thank you and uh, good luck uh, everybody. Keep the passion, please, as we saw from our speakers, and let's protect journalism against digital threats. Thank you and goodbye.